my poor sin sick soul Christ in every burden roll now I walk redeemed and whole hand in hand with Jesus hand in hand we walk each day hand in hand along the way walking thus I cannot stray hand in hand with Jesus in my night of dark despair Jesus heard and answered prayer now I'm walking free as air hand in hand with Jesus hand in hand we walk each day hand in hand along the way walking thus I cannot stray hand in hand with Jesus The stars are backward rolled, and his home I shall behold. I will walk that street of gold, hand in hand with Jesus. Hand in hand. Hand in hand along the way Walking thus I cannot stray Hand in hand with Jesus Walking thus I cannot stray with Jesus. Thank you. Have you ever heard so much racket in your life? Somebody get ready to preach putting up guitars and chords and everything? Well, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. I enjoy church. I really love church. I was telling Kelly this uh, this morning, I, I, so I got to share this with people. And if you're from West Virginia, you'll see where we're coming from on this. But um, there's a fellow, he had a sick mule and he didn't know what to do. So he called his Uncle Joe, who once had a mule. And uh, he said, Uncle Joe, he said, didn't your mule get sick one time? He said, yep. He said, what did you do? He said, I fed him turpentine. And uh, so the young man took some turpentine, gave it to his mule, and the mule died. So, <laughs> so he immediately picked up the phone and said <clears throat> to, to his uncle, he said, Uncle Joe, I thought you told me that you fed your mule turpentine. Yep, I did. And he said, uh, I took your advice and it killed my mule. He said, yep, killed mine too. <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> don't listen to Uncle Joe, amen? By the way, I mean that politically too. <laughs> amen? <laughs> no, don't listen to Uncle Joe. You don't know what he's talking about anyway. All right, uh, Galatians 6, Galatians chapter number 6, if you can figure out what he's saying, by the way, but anyway. Galatians chapter number 6. I want to read one verse here. Classic verse, a great verse. 
It says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know, there's some things, there's some things beyond conversion that we really ought to pay attention to. A lot, a lot of people think, well, you know what, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and uh, that's all I'm concerned about. There's much more than just being saved. Uh, the Bible talks about in uh, Hebrews, it says there's some things, <clears throat> there's some things that accompany salvation. Here's one of them right here. Look at it again. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, now he's talking to, uh, to Christians, so he says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Let's have a word of prayer. I'll, <clears throat> I'll give you an introduction. And then we'll give you some things about this verse, okay? Our Father, tonight we love you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to uh, sing, to preach, to praise you, uh, to let our requests be made known unto you. Father, you're the only one really can do anything about it. And uh, so we come to thee because thou art God, thou art almighty, and uh, you have everything in control. We pray now tonight that you'll help us pray for our country. We ask your God that you'll help us tonight in this gathering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever wondered why people go to church? You ever wonder why people go to church? Most, most people believe that uh, uh, only good people go to church. And so they, they, they don't go. You know why? Uh, in fact, you've probably witnessed to people and they'll say something like this. You know what? I would get saved, but I want to make sure I can live it. You know what they're saying? They're saying... I don't want to be a hypocrite. And that's, that's noble. And so there's a lot of people that don't go to church because they think that only good people go to church. And since they'll look at themselves, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I'm not really that good. So if I go to church, I just don't want to be a hypocrite. And so a lot of people don't go to church for that reason. Then there's a lot of people feel that, that they are just as good morally as people who do go to church. And a lot of times they're right. You know, there's some good moral people out there. And they live just as good morally, maybe better morally, than a lot of church folks. And then there's, a, then there's, a, there's, there's people who go on a regular basis. And they feel superior to everybody else. So there's different reasons why people go to church. But really, you know what a church is? Uh, really, a church is a hospital. For weak and sick folk, spiritually. And so, if I'm, I'm going to say this for the sake of, I know this is being recorded and sent out, and, uh, but I, I'm going to say this. I hope you understand what I'm going to say. But if you're a lost sinner, you ought to feel at home in this church. You said, What are you talking about, preacher? Do you, do, you, do you have a church service in order to be sinner friendly? No. I'm just saying that we are here th tonight. We're all sinners saved by God's grace. So as a sinner, you ought to feel at home in this church because that's, all we, that's what we are. We're sinners saved by grace. And you're in the company of sinners. Amen. But we've been saved by grace and we want to... We want to try to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we come to church. That's why we learn what the Bible has to say. That's why we get instruction. But we make no claim to self-righteousness. And uh, the Pharisees were self-righteous. There's an author, some of you know, uh, read, from, or read uh, books by Henry Ward Beecher. I know Preacher has some, and uh, maybe some of you. But here's what he said. He said, the church is not an art gallery for the display of eminent saints, but a hospital for the curing of weak ones. So that's what the church is all about, a hospital. And, and what he said was really scriptural. Now, let me give you three things to help our concept of the church. What's the church all about? Well, if you look at verse 1 here. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, when you look at this verse, there is a danger that we all face. Every single one of us face these two things. Number one, every single one of us face being overtaken. Overtaken. You know, Webster defines overtaken as to come up with a course to a, a pursuit, a 
a progress or motion to catch. But it really, really means to take by surprise. How many of you, by a show of hands, how many of you ever been caught off guard in something? Well, I have. Do you know what? Sometimes we get caught off guard spiritually. We really do. You know what the preachers, and since I are one, uh, sometimes pre things go through a preacher's mind why so-and-so is not here, you know. So-and-so didn't come to her. Oh, I know, why. I know why they're not here. Because I raked them over the coals last week. That's why they're not here. And then, and then here they come in. I said, how you doing, brother? Oh, good. I've been sick for two weeks. I had flu for two weeks. It makes me feel about that big. But boy, I had an idea. I know exactly why they, they're not right with God. I don't know that. You know what that's called in the Bible? That's called evil surmisings. I surmised something that wasn't right. And, and so all of us get overtaken. All of us let our guard down every now and then. Uh, and, and so let, let, me, let me show you something in 1 Thessalonians here. 1 Thessalonians, we're, we're pretty close, but look at chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Let's look at verse number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse number 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren. So he's talking to brethren, right? And he's talking to cistern too, if that's a word. <laughs> brethren and cistern. I know what a cistern is, don't y'all? <laughs> but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So they know something here, perfectly. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh, cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now watch this. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should, what's the word? overtake you as a thief. You know what that verse is saying? It's hard, listen, it's hard to be overtaken, taken by surprise when you're in the light. You ever have somebody to jump out and scare you in the dark? I, I mean, you know, well, you know, if, that's, if that happens in daylight, you can't, hardly, you can't hardly be surprised in the daylight. But when something comes at you out of the dark, it may overtake you. So, you know what we need to be doing? We need to keep in the light. Jude tells us about that. Keep in the light, keep in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so we're, we're, we're all in danger of being overtaken. Y'all believe that? Yes, There's not a one of us here that could not, uh, at one time or another, be overtaken with something. You know, I'm going to tell you something. If you stay in this book, if you stay in the light of God's Word, it would be quite hard for you to be overtaken. But if you, if you neglect this book, somebody could come along. Uh, let, let me tell you something. You know why there's so many Baptists, so-called Baptists, that are leaving Baptist churches and joining in cults? I'm telling you why. Because they've not been in the book. And they've been overtaken. And, and so, here, the, the other word I want you to look at is not only overtaken, but fault. Fault. You know what, the, I, I, I'm interested in, uh, in this word because in the NIV, it says, if someone is caught in a sin, that's what that verse says in the NIV, if someone is caught in a sin, in the New King James Version, it says this, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you know the best way to study your Bible is get your Bible, a good Bible, King James Bible, and get you a concordance and get you a good dictionary. And that's basically all you need. Now I got books. I got I'm book poor. I got all kinds of books. But I'm telling you, when I study, I'll get this blessed old book and I'll get a concordance and I'll get my dictionary. And I'm telling you what, it that's hard to beat. Amen. You know what Webster says a fault is? Now listen. A fault is an erring or missing, a failing, a blunder. Anybody ever make a blunder in here? <laughs> it's kind of like a picture. And it's not funny. In a sense, it's funny. But it's kind of like a man walking on ice. And, you know. And he slips. I told you in one message that Kelly and I used to watch uh, figure skating because we like to see the skaters fall. I mean. 
especially if they do those those spins up in the air and uh, they come and they land and they fall and it's almost like hey, look you've done this you you've been walking through Walmart or somewhere and you slip and and, and it's just so embarrassing and and then you kind of get your composure back and act like nothing's happened you just walk on you look around and see if anybody saw you <laughs> if Kelly would have saw you she'd laugh out loud you tell but but Webster says it's a blunder, it's a defect, it's a neglect of duty. Now let me show you this verse in, uh, or this word in three different verses. Matthew 18. Let's look at Matthew 18. And I'm doing this for a reason. Matthew chapter number 18. We're looking at faults now. We're not looking at sin. We're looking at faults. And there's a difference. Matthew 18. Look at verse number 15. Matthew 18, verse number 15. All right. We there? Verse number 15, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. Do you see that? Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 6. Pretty close to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and look at verse number 6. All right, are we there yet? All right, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 6. But brother go to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, and what is the fault? The next statement, because ye go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Yea, you do wrong and defraud and that's your brother and so forth. So here was the fault. The fault was they're going to law with one another. Didn't say it was a sin, but it was a fault. Now look what James says. James chapter 5. And this has to do with prayer. James chapter number 5 and verse number 16. James 5 and 16. All right, are you there? Now, this is very important. Now, look at it. Confess your faults one to another. You know what the NIV says? Confess your sins one to another. That's what the Catholics use. That's what it says in the NIV. Confess your sin. Look, I confess my sin to nobody but Jesus Christ. Now, I can confess my faults to you. You can confess your faults to me. And we all have them. But I'm going to tell you what, there's no man on this earth where we need to confess our faults to. Nobody, not a preacher, not a priest, not a rabbi, whatever. Confess your faults. By the way, the New King James says to confess your trespasses. But we're to confess our faults. Now, what if I thought about faults. And to me, I go to Walmart sometimes. I hate it, but I go there. When I go to Walmart and I've got a buggy, I go down the aisles as if I were driving. I stay on the right-hand side. And I would like for everybody else to stay on their right-hand side. Now, when I'm going down the right-hand side in my buggy and somebody's coming up at me head-on, I'm thinking, why? Now, I'm just made that way. To me, that's a fault. It's not a sin. It's not against the law. It's not against the Bible. But it's a fault to me. When, does it bother you when you let somebody out at an intersection? You, you let them out. I mean, they're, they, they've been there. They've been sitting there for two or three minutes. And you pull up and you see. And you say, come on, I'll motion you and they, and they just go on. They don't even thank you. They don't wave at you. They don't toot the horn. I want to say, I'm sorry I ever let you out of there. <laughs> to me, that's a fault. That's not a sin. It's not on the rule book. It's not on the law book, I don't think. But to me, it's a fault. Don't we all have faults? We all got them. But it doesn't say confess your faults one to another. It says, 
or confess your sins one to another. It says confess your faults one to another. Now, so in this verse in, in uh, Galatians, back in Galatians, there's, there's two things we got to remember. Overtaken and fault. Now, there's a danger though. Now, listen to what I'm going to say. There's a danger of minimizing sin in two ways. Number one, by changing its name. You know, we don't call it drunkenness anymore. We call it alcoholism. But God says it's drunk. It's a drunkard. And say it was an alcoholic, he says a drunkard. We talk about gay. But the Bible said it's not gay. It's sodomy. That's what the Bible says. We think we can minimize this thing by changing its name. I read a story. I read a story about a, a Rotary Club got together, and they were having a water problem in their town, and they were trying to uh, get something put on a, a, a ballot for the folks to to vote on. And uh, they were they it, it, it was a, it was a water issue, and what they were doing was they were going to recycle wastewater. <laughs> And use it for drinking water. But the speaker did not use the word wastewater. He used the word sewage water. <laughs> and somebody says at this, at this club meeting. And somebody said, no, we can't do that. We cannot put that on the ballot. It just wouldn't sound right. So here's what we'll do. We'll put wastewater instead of sewage water. Because it's more acceptable to be called wastewater than it would be sewage water. But in either case, it's the same water. Vance Havner said, you can call it a rash or you can call it an itch, but you got to scratch it just the same. <laughs> So, so here's what, here's the danger of minimizing sin is by changing its name. You know what sin is called? Sin is called a mistake. Sin is called a blunder. Sin is called a social misunderstanding and on and on and on it goes. But we're in a danger of not only changing its name, but by blaming it on circumstances. For instance, I'm lonely. So I'll get involved with somebody else's wife because she talks to me all the time at the office and she makes me feel good. So I'll just get involved with her. I'm stressed out. So I think I'll go home and smoke a weed or take me a drink because I feel so much better. And there's really nothing wrong with it. It just helps me, settles my nerves. Well, the boss doesn't pay me enough. So I just think I'll just take a little bit here and take something there and just take it home with me. After all, it's owed to me. I put in a lot of time. And so, so here's what we do. We not only minimize by calling, calling its name, but we call it a different name, but we minimize sin by our circumstances. Well, you don't understand. I grew up in a... I'm telling you, nobody had it as hard as old Joseph did. Joseph, sold by his brothers, thrown in a pit, thrown in jail. I mean, then he, he ends up being second in command in Egypt. You, look, you talking about some dysfunctional families? They're in the Bible. You say, well, I, but my family life, you don't understand. I understand what the Bible says. And I'm just telling you, you can overcome all of that stuff. Many people have. And so the danger here, the danger that we all face being overtaken and then the fall. But then there's something else I want you to see. Not only the danger that we all face, but the duty that we all have. Now notice what he says. That if a man be overtaken in a, spirit, in a fall, ye which are spiritual... Now, you don't want anybody carnal trying to help you out. You don't want anybody that's a gossip to try to help you out. Look, he says, uh, by the way, there's three options that we have. But if, there, if there's going to be any help whatsoever, it's going to be from a person that is spiritual. You see that? 
He which is spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. So there's three, three options that we have. Number one, we can ignore the brother. That's what a lot of times, that's what a lot of people do. They just ignore him. They're like that, thief, they're like that priest and that Levite. Uh, just looks at the one who's been overtaken by thieves on the road to, uh, to Jericho. And they pass on. They look at him. They see him laying there half dead. They pass on. They pass on. They say, I just don't want to get involved. Let's just ignore him. A lot of people do that. A lot of people who call themselves Christians will ignore a brother. And it's almost like we turn a blind eye to them. Uh, you know what? I just don't want to really get involved. But we ought to get involved. We can ignore them. We can deplore them. In other words, we can criticize, find fault. Well, they wouldn't be like this if they, and then we say something, if they were in church, if they read their Bible more, if they did this. Put yourself in their place. Aren't you glad somebody helped you one day when you were down and out? Aren't you glad somebody picked you up when you were laying there half dead, spiritually speaking? The Bible says we can do three things, or, or, or we can do three things. We can what? We can ignore them, or we can deplore them, or we can do what it says here. We can restore them. Amen? That's what God wants us to do. We can restore them. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. So, you know, we can add to his grief by verbally shooting him down. He's already down. And, uh, but restore here is a medical term. I remember I talk, talked about a hospital here. Here's a medical term. The medical term is this. That word restore really means to set in joint. If there's a bone broken or a dislocated joint, it means to set it back in place. And that's what God wants us to do. So we all face a danger. We all have a duty. But then lastly, there is a disposition that all of us need. There's two things I want you to see. Number one, there's a disposition of meekness. Of meekness. You, you know, a pride, a pride person, a proud person, prideful person, they can't help anybody out because they're not considering themselves. They'll say something like this. Well, I'll never let myself get in that kind of shape. How do you know? You might get in that kind of shape. Right circumstances come along. But if you're going to help anybody out, you've got to remember this, that that could be you. We have to have a disposition of meekness, helping in the spirit of love and the spirit of long-suffering and tenderness. And by the way, isn't meekness one of the part of the fruit of the spirit? And so that's why he said, ye which are spiritual, do it in the spirit of meekness. And then not only a disposition of meekness, but a disposition of Weakness, weakness. Look what he said, considering thyself. Look at verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something, haven't you met those? Boy, look at me, I'm something. Yeah, you're. <laughs> I said that to daddy one time. I said, dad, I'm really something. I'm, I'm, dad, did you see that basketball? You see that shot I made? I'm really something. He said, you're something all right. <laughs> Man, he never went along with anything like that. He shot me down all the time, but I needed it. Amen. So, so he says, if a, <laughs> if a man think himself to be something when he is what? When he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Paul said that he was, I mentioned this this morning. Paul said, number one, he was a chief of sinners. Paul said he was least of the apostles. He went on to say that he was less than the least. Now that's pretty far back. That's pretty far down. He says I'm less than the least of all saints. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. We'll close with this verse here. We're in uh, Galatians. Let's go back a few pages and uh, close with 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians 10 and let's look at verse, I think we want to look at verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 10 and 12. All right. Verse number 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Who's the person that's going to be spiritual enough to help somebody else? It's going to be the person that will acknowledge 
his, meek, his weakness and that will exhibit his meekness. That could be me. That could be you. You know what? I didn't understand it back then at the time. But I understand it very clearly. My mom and my dad used to say, don't ever, don't ever, ever make fun of people. Some, some people can't help the way they're raised. Some people can't help the way they've turned out. Some people can't, but some people can't. Some people cannot help their mental capacity. Some people cannot help their physical inabilities. And mom and dad would say, don't you dare make fun of somebody. Because that could be you. You know, all it takes, all it takes is for one brain cell just to go out of whack. And we'll be drooling all over ourselves. We'll be like a vegetable. We, don't even, we won't even know we're in this world. So look, when there's a brother or a sister that is down and out, People that's going to help them are going to be spiritual enough to say, that could be me. I'm going to help them out. Amen? That's what we need. You see, there's more. There's something beyond conversion. There's something more than just being saved and going to heaven. We've got a church. We've got a church of people that are hurting. We've got a church, along with other churches, Church is full of people that need help, that needs just a pick them up, that needs a phone call, that needs a card sent, that needs a visit. And that's what we need to help our brothers and sisters out in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, tonight I pray that something has been said that will stir our souls, Lord, to realize that it's not about us. It's about other people. It's not about how I feel. It's about how others are. Father, help us be like that good Samaritan that saw that man laying down and he took care of his need. Not even the same race. Not even the same culture. But yet he had compassion in his heart. Father, help us to have compassion upon lost people, upon saved people, upon the backslid, upon the discouraged, upon folks, Lord, that maybe maybe they don't think exactly the way we do or see the way see things the way we do. Help us, Lord, tonight. Help us to humble ourselves and to realize that could be me laying under a bridge. That could be me homeless living in a cardboard box. That could be me all crippled up. That could be me with my mind just blown apart. I pray, Heavenly Father, you'll help us. Help us to be spiritual enough to help people out. Especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. You can live as you please But you must pay the cost Goes by the crow.